Good morning. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, introduce our two uh, di distinguished speakers this morning, the first session. Our uh, first speaker is uh, Professor uh, Shoba Fu. Uh, Professor Fu uh, received his PhD from Mechanics of Materials from University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. And um, he is a uh, very established scholar in our field. Uh, she authored more than 300 publications on topic ranging from digital library, information retrieval, and also bibliometrics, I believe. And he is uh, current, currently serves as Deputy Associate Provost at the President's Office at uh, uh, a national Nanyang University, also. <laughs> Uh, also from NTU, right? It's, uh, we have the same acronym. And today his topic is the ETD uh, management ecosystem. So uh, please join me to welcome our uh, first speaker, Professor Fu. Thank you. Hello, very good morning, colleagues and friends. Um, my name is Robert Fu. I'm from NTU Singapore. First of all, I would like to thank Prof Kerr, who is not around, for inviting me for the ETD conference, and of course to Professor Cheng from uh, National Central, uh, Central University uh, Library, NCL, for, for the opportunity to talk to all of you. It's been very nice to come back to Taiwan again, to, to visit Taiwan and see some old friends. Um, my talk today is about uh, the ETD management ecosystem. In fact, ETD is something new to me. This is my very first conference uh, in ETD. Um, my own research area is really into digital libraries as well as information retrieval. So it's very interesting for me to learn about what uh, you folks in the ETD arena has been thinking of, some of the challenges that you have been facing, and also for me to understand much more of uh, what, what you're thinking about for the future. And for today, I think my talk can sort of complement what, what I've been hearing so far, to look at uh, different things beyond ETDs, to look at the accompaniment of ETDs in terms of uh, research data, as well as beyond research data, to look at the bigger arena of information that we work as uh, when we are doing our PhDs, when we do our master's thesis and our PhD thesis. Uh, I want to give some acknowledgement, as uh, Ed Fox uh, duly say, uh, we, have, uh, we have three people that I would like to acknowledge. The Dr. Zhang Xue, who is my postdoc fellow, and uh, uh, Ran Yang is, in fact, from my uh, colleagues from my Office of Information, uh, Knowledge, and Library Services. She's in charge of the scholarly publishing and impact. There is one more name I do not know why it's not there. Uh, it's Suni. She's, in fact, looking after the research data management. And these two colleagues of mine, uh, as well as my postdoc fellow, uh, in fact, all, all my former students at some point in time, and I think they are really the people who have been working much more on EDDs than myself. So it's great that they've worked with me on this paper uh, to understand the situation better. So as I mentioned earlier, my talk is about uh, three areas. We, I want to give, first of all, a report of the EDDs that we have uh, been working on in Nanyang Technological University. And later on, we want to talk a little bit more about the research data, which is really part and parcel of the whole research process. I want to give an update of what's happening uh, in terms of uh, evolving uh, the research data. It is reasonably new in the area of Singapore. And I want to sort of share with you some of the studies that we have done and how we are trying to promote the use of uh, research data management in a larger way in Singapore. And then later on, for my final section, I want to look a little bit more beyond ETDs to look at other things which are produced in the research process and whether there's a need for us to look at a larger management ecosystem for us to be able to manage the whole gamut of information being produced uh, during the way. So these are the three areas that I would like to spend some time uh, thinking about today. So we, well, in NTU itself, we are very fortunate to have an, an open access mandate uh, for all our publications, including dissertations, thesis, as well as research data. We have, in fact, a mandate to put things into the open access. This was quite a recent development, 
and because of the recency of the developments, we found that there is a bit of time for us to catch up of what we have done before in the past. Okay, so we have uh, DRNTU, which is called the Digital Repository of NTU, DRNTU Restricted Access, as well as Open Access. And we have also the NTU data, which is quite launched about a year ago. So this is something very new to us. Okay? The reason why we have actually three, uh, three different systems is because of the way the systems have been introduced uh, over the years. We started with the DRNTU uh, restricted access because there was a time we put everything into the repository, but we not had the chance to really fully embrace the open access movement. And at a point in time, uh, whatever was collected was put inside there. It was described. But I must report that um, we did not really put as much effort as we should have to really ensure the quality of the metadata as well as the quality of the dissertations that were submitted. That's why everything was put under restricted access. And then when the open access came along, we began to, to start to migrate things from the restricted access into the open access. And then thereafter, we began to collect things uh, in, under open access partly because of the uh, quality restrictions that we realized that well, we are now able to obtain much better quality dissertations. We are now able to endow them with much richer and better metadata. So now we are now beginning to move much more into open access. Okay? Uh, DRNTU data is something new. Uh, we realized at some point that it is so important for us and part of the whole movement that we also need to open up uh, our data for people to use as well as beyond what we have put into the publication uh, repositories. Okay. Uh, well, we will see that open access has been advocated a lot, uh, mandated by many, many universities, and this is not surprising for all of us. We have been discussing this for the last couple of days. So we have actually now have much uh, better open access policies. In fact, somebody told me that we're very fortunate to have open access policies, to have the ability to mandate things, although we have never used uh, the cane sort of a, a punitive way to force people to put things in, we always believe in advocating the good reasons why we should adopt open access. And this is the kind of approach that we have been using to try to encourage instead of coercing people to put information into our repositories. Okay. Uh, okay. So these are uh, the other aspects of uh, open access that we have uh, I mentioned earlier that all of us are required to put our final versions of papers as well as final versions of data into our repositories. Okay. And of course nowadays many funding agencies will stipulate open access as part of the grant condition. This is increasingly something we notice. Every time we need to apply for national grants, international grants, this is becoming more commonplace that they require us because it's publicly funded money. They really want to see the data being put inside there to be shared, to be reused, uh, to be worked upon and improved upon by other researchers. Okay. So this really uh, gives us the opportunity by having open access to free up papers to provide much more greater visibility for people around the world uh, to actually use them, to view them, use them and to continue the process of engaging the knowledge creation process. Uh, the other avenue is really self-archival. There are many institutions or many publishers that allows us to have versions of self-archival papers put into our repositories. So beyond the abstracts that you find in the publications, uh, publications websites, uh, it's also good for us to, to be able to put in full versions of camera-ready copies so people have the opportunity, first and foremost, to be able to look at all the publications in the shortest possible time once they are made available. Uh, this is the uh, current status of open access and restricted access ETDs in NTU. You find that uh, we are still quite slow compared to many universities in terms of putting information. You notice that we have still much more restricted access ETDs uh, uh, in terms of both the STEM and the non-STEM. The non-STEM refers to disciplines of arts, uh, humanities, social sciences. Okay? So now we're beginning to move more things into open access. We will actually find that the, this distribution will change as we begin to uh, migrate most of the restricted access information into the open access repositories and for new open access uh, deposits to be made in the future. Okay. And uh, around the world, we, we are actually seeing many initiatives to promote the ETDs. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, there was a lively discussion about DOIs. We have been now talking much more about DOIs to be accorded to the dissertations to give it more 
potential and to give it the visibility that perhaps it could, it could need so that they're able to be discovered better, be able to be used by researchers around the world. So we see that many of the, uh, many of the publications, uh, according to the thesis and dissertations, have been accorded DOIs. Yeah. Uh, other initiatives are really the open kind of uh, repositories. Yesterday, the keynote gave us a, a very good, uh, Sanjay gave us a very good uh, overview of all the things that's happening around the world. And you see that many of them have been advocating open access. So these are some examples uh, of what the various organizations have been proposing. And I won't cover them because Sanjay has did an excellent job to cover them yesterday. Okay, so things like EBSCO, things like uh, the earlier ones. Uh, I did a search on EBSCO just to have a look at how much data they have in there. And I did something on the search on museum studies. I found that there, there's plenty of things related to museum studies in Taiwan, which they are really uh, famous for. And beyond Taiwan doing research on Taiwan itself, I found, of course, dissertations done by colleagues as far, as far down or as far up as London School of Economics. So, we, so this are, thesis are beginning to appear in uh, different parts of um, uh, the arena. Okay. So these are uh, the metadata for this thesis. Notice that this particular thesis from the LSE is also uh, linked to the British Library, the ethos system. Okay? So we find that, uh, indeed, we talk a little bit about access, universal access for different dissertations. You find that the different repositories are sort of uh, helping each other by populating their, their databases or the, with, with all their metadata to allow better discovery. Um, yesterday, we talked a little bit about whether we can have a union catalog of all the dissertations. Uh, of course, what I'm thinking of is a much more integrated catalog, but we do understand that in the scenarios, uh, different um, publishers and different uh, bodies have their own policies, own ideals, and so on. So perhaps it's difficult for us to have a mother of all union catalogs so that the, the user can just use one catalog and find any dissertation under the sun for the particular topic. Uh, the, the, the idea is very important because when a PhD student first does his or her research, it is very important for him or her to actually know what has been done before because he or she is going to spend the next four years of his or her life to really look at the topic and work on a dissertation. And it's so important for them to know if they miss a dissertation or two around the world, when they begin to work on their projects and later on do the horror, find that whatever they have done has been done before, that it is really a very painful uh, wake-up call for them. Right? So it is very important for us to have the extensive ability to search and search well, to identify all areas. I remember when I did my PhD many years ago, I used UMI to look for all dissertations out there. Uh, nowadays, there's many more platforms. We need to now be much more exhaustive to be able to find related work before we start anything. And for us to read, what are the challenges? The other thing that's very important is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to be able to look at what is done before, to look at the sort of future work being proposed in those dissertations. After four years of work, they have proposed some new ideas that could be developed further to be expanded upon. And I think it's important for us to know what these are so that we can build upon research instead of trying to do something which is quite similar. Right? So the, 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 the discovery will actually help us um, make better use of all this information that's already out there. In terms of NTU, we have been working hard to promote open access. Since we announced the mandate for open access at NTU, we have held uh, seminars, workshops, participating in International Open Access Week. Uh, other initiatives are really about explaining to people why now there's a need for us to look beyond thesis and dissertations, which is really the requirement. Every time you want to get your degree at the end of the day, you need to submit your thesis and dissertation after your oral presentations. But nowadays, we actually want to go beyond that. We want people to be able to deposit their research data as a way for them to uh, allow other researchers to reproduce the data. We want to ensure that whatever data they claim that they have used for the analysis can be reproduced by other people. So we want to advocate that research data is a very important component while it is not mandatory at this point in time, I do foresee that eventually, instead of just submitting the thesis and dissertations, they will also need to submit their data, the research data as part of the requirement uh, for graduation. Okay. And because RDM is fairly new to, to us in, in Singapore, we actually participated in a global study 
uh, to just understand where we are in terms of RDM, what the researchers want, what, kind, uh, what are the needs and what can be done in terms of helping them in, in terms of training and support. So for us, we actually adopted uh, this global study developed by Surab and uh, Gobinda Chowdhury. Uh, they are from the ECIL community, European uh, Conference on Digital or Information Literacy. And they did uh, a 30 country survey. We participated in this. It was done from November to January. And all in all, we collected 643 responses, analyzed uh, 241. And the next few slides actually show the kind of findings that we've had uh, on the survey. We found that uh, most of the researchers that uh, responded to the survey are in their early uh, research uh, age, about 18 to about 35. These are young researchers. The older folks didn't seem to care so much about whether it's important uh, to worry too much about research data, but certainly it's good to see the young researchers uh, uh, responding to the survey. Uh, generally, most of the respondents are from the academia and other research students are making the smaller part of the uh, proportion. Okay. And in terms of research experience, most of them are quite new in the research between five to 10 years. Uh, the rest uh, are less so. So these are really uh, younger researchers. We also asked them about where do you think they would like to store their research data. At this present moment in time, you find that most of them are storing their, re their research data in their own computers, their own hard disk drives and things like that which is really a, a, not a good situation because all of us know that this is something not very permanent and when they finish their research, they put it in the hard disk drives. Eventually when they leave, they leave with their hard disk drives, right? And other people have been putting things into the cloud and for in terms of central repositories, we only find that about one third or, or 17%, 29% have been putting their data into uh, our repositories. And of course, other people put in outside repositories. So this picture is not really uh, very flattering. We need to do much more work to be able to provide the kind of functionality and the space and the storage for all the researchers to be able to put their data into central repositories that we can look after much more longer and better in terms of perpetuity. Okay. In terms of sharing research data, we also ask them, uh, are they willing to share research data with, with, with other people within the teams, outside the team, or outside the institutions? And we find that most of the respondents are quite happy to share research within their teams, less so with other researchers in the same university, and less so with research, researchers in other universities. So sharing is not a culture that has been uh, inculcated uh, at this moment in time. Okay, but there's something that we need to work on as well. We also follow on with a question to ask them about the concerns for research data sharing. What is it that uh, is stopping them or giving them hesitations to share data? And these are some of the uh, findings that we have found. They are concerned about legal and ethical issues. They are concerned about uh, lack of appropriate policies and rights protection, okay? as well as data that they share could be misinterpreted or misused. And I think these are very valid concerns. And this kind of findings have been also been found in other universities where research data sharing is pretty new in, in their universities. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, in, so, so in terms of our development in the research data repository, we have actually um, developed our Dataverse, the Harvard Dataverse, to sort our research data. We are now uh, conducting very regular workshops, seminars, and uh, to, to sort of educate our researchers about what they can do, what is the advantage of sharing their research data, how we can help them to facilitate the process, how we're able to help them to develop their uh, data management plans and so on. So there's a period now that we are actively engaging all our researchers uh, to, to really try to win them over that why it's so necessary for them to share, what are the benefits, why they should do it, and how they can do it, and what kind of help uh, we can accord to them. So this is our current uh, data management framework that we have in NTU. You find that uh, because we've only implemented this for a year, there are still areas which is not done, but in the process of being done. So we're looking at before the start of the research process uh, to talk about the open access advocacy at the very corner here. Uh, yeah, this part here. We are now looking also at DMP writing workshops 
for them to be able to write better data management plans. Uh, we are beginning to now to look at also looking at the quality of these DMPs when they're submitted and to go back to them to help them refine them if we find that there are areas of poor improvement. We are also now beginning to look at copyright to see whether they are uh, putting all this into perspective in their DMPs. Uh, and of course, during the research process where they are actually managing the active data, we would expect different, <clears throat> different iterative uh, rounds of creating new research data over time. So things like versioning and things like that becomes very important for them to actively manage their research. Of course, at the end of the research, when they have their final data, when they deposit their, their final data sets, their final dissertations, this is where we're, we're interested to look after, uh, to actually encourage them to endow all their research data, as well as the thesis with very good metadata, so they become easily discoverable uh, by, by the world. And we have not done really the long-term digital preservation, although we have begun to understand what are the systems that we need to procure to make this happen. So this is the, the state of what's happening in research data management at NTU. Okay. And these are some of the ideas that we've been using to try to promote uh, research data sharing. Again, having a series of workshops, seminars, uh, talks uh, for people to come in to do hands-on, for them to get familiarized with how we are able to help them manage their research data, giving them assurance that their data is good and safe in our hands. So that's some of the things happening uh, on, in terms of research data. Now I want to move on to my last section of the talk. It's about digital ecosystems. The thing that when I spoke to my colleagues about um, thesis dissertations as well as research data, I asked them about beyond the scope of this, what are the other kind of information or documents you produce in the research life cycle? I think all of us in the room have done uh, research before. They probably have all done your, your master's or PhD thesis. You found that you have actually created a lot of information. Uh, what do we do with them? Right? Do, are we just happy with just submitting a final product called the thesis or dissertation? Is it also enough for us to submit our research data to accompany our thesis to prove to people uh, that these are the, the data that's been used to churn out? You can test it out, you can reproduce it, you can extend it, and so on. What about the other forms of information that has been produced along the way? Are these important things for us to think about at this moment in time? Right? So when I was thinking about this, I thought about all these different uh, ecosystems. Systems which are much larger uh, than th the final product itself, but to think of it as a system where they are uh, literally a very open, loosely coupled demand-driven system which can be self-organizing by the people in a community. Okay? So basically for, for me the digital ecosystem is a, is a way for us to look at different aspects of the research to see how we're able to pull everything together to give a full story, a full picture of what's been done uh, evolving into the final product of your thesis and dissertations. Okay? So, so we've actually seen the adoption of digital ecosystems in different uh, domains, like in education, in business, as well as research. Uh, in terms of research, there is an organization within Europe called the Eurochris, which has been uh, very much involved with research information management, and they have developed their own systems to store all kinds of information in relation to all the Eurochris discussions, a conference that is held every two years. And I thought, hmm, this is something quite important for us to really consider. We are already embarking or embracing Chris as part of the way for us to manage our research information. But I was also thinking, is there anything beyond uh, what, we, what we traditionally want to keep as part of the whole sphere of information? Then I started to think of our own ETD systems. Um, as a student, when I was uh, a student a long, long time ago, I always thought of what are the things that's important for me. I, I, I remember keeping things like my journals, my logs of my research, what I did on a regular basis. I remember meeting my supervisors, taking notes and so on. Of course, those days were all done with paper and pen, but nowadays things are much more electronic. So what, what are the typical things that you think uh, that we, we are engaged with uh, nowadays in our research process? We have meetings with our supervisors, we have meeting notes, lots of emails, we keep our, our logs, we produce progress reports, we produce IRB documents, we have communication with conference organizers to present our conferences, 
our journals and so on. So in fact, you find that there's a lot of things we produce uh, as part of the whole research process. And the question is, how important are these things? Is there a need for us to consider them as the whole package that we need to have some orderly way to organize them, store them, manage them, and allow the world to be able to see them? Okay? And one of the motivations, I think, for doing this, right, is for us to think about some of the problems that we had about research integrity, uh, about plagiarism, and all kinds of so-called the scandals It was mentioned in, I think, the first day of the conference, that people have been found to, to do research fraud, all kinds of things. If we are able to be able to look at all these documents and store them in a way that is accessible, would that be a deterrent for such frauds to happen? Will people be much more daring to do things? Because now they know everything has been stored. Every email that they ever communicate with the supervisors or the external world is now been stored. And people have the ability to be able to find and look for evidence of things. Right? So I think there is, beyond ETDs, beyond research data, we need to think about the whole suite of research-generated documents. And I discussed some of these ideas with my, my colleagues, and I said, don't you think these are important that we we have now the ability to store them. After all, now they are born digital. It's much more easier for us to, to be able to look at, look at them and see how we're able to store them to allow open scholarship and open data to have the ability to assess them. Okay? So basically what, what, what we are thinking of is, in fact, for the whole community to consider, is it possible for us to look at or identify a selected range of documents that we feel are very relevant, that is related to the research process, that we should properly archive, index, and interlink them for reference. Okay? We can, of course, depending on how much volume of the data documents, we can certainly assign unique IDs to them, be it a handler, be it a DOI, so that we are able to find them quite easily. Can we enrich those documents with metadata? Because if we don't, then the discovery, of course, has been hindered. Right? Can we uh, use interoperability standards so that when we define something, it is much more uh, searchable, much more standardized. We can also consider things like privacy and data protection. Of course, some of the emails you do not want to share with the whole world of what you have done with a supervisor because they may be scolding you for things you have not done and so on. But certainly, there's nothing to stop you from making them restricted access. Okay? But nonetheless, that has been stored which means that you can leave a trail of what's happening, of what has happened between the time you did your research and the time that the information was published. Okay? So, it, and if you're able to consider this range of documents, put metadata on them, store them, then really is how do we then provide a list of um, functionality? Can we, are we able to provide uh, interfaces for us to browse them, to search for them, visualize them? and so on, right? So, so we can have different ways to support browsing of such an ecosystem. We can let people search if they have much more uh, information that they already know of how to search for it. We can let people uh, explore them to clustering. We can use timelines for us to draw up documents as and when they are produced, okay? Um, and typically what, what, what we're looking at is, it is really a very kind of an open link data kind of idea where, where people, places, events, documents, and so all of this are all part of this whole ecosystem, right? So a student A may be uh, doing some work with student B. Student A produces a dissertation where he publishes in conferences, journals, he's got supervisors or joint supervisors or a thesis committee. And in the process of doing his or her research, there are many things being produced in the process, uh, proposals, minutes, reports, and so on and all kinds of other kinds of uh, digital objects have been produced. Okay? So this is really thinking a little bit larger, beyond thesis and dissertations, beyond research data, is on a larger area of what information has been produced. And how do we now put some uh, kind of scenarios of use? I ask my students, if you think these are good things, tell me some ideas of how you want to use such a, such a data set. Right? So they basically gave me two, my, my, my uh, Zhang Xue gave me two, he says, perhaps I'm looking for my own record of meeting minutes years after my research has been done. All right? so, so, so she has done a PhD on environmental scanning. She, she, she logs into the system. Okay? She's now able, after logging to the system, be able to find all the data that was associated with the research, including meeting minutes that she had as a student 
over the different years, over the different months. So she can retract them as and when she wants to uh, have, have information uh, of all these things that have happened before in the past. Okay? Uh, other scenarios, uh, perhaps she wants to, to look at, she has a topic, she wants to look at some of the references that she has done. And based on the references that she has done, she now identifies a particular conference that she has attended before. She was quite keen to look at other conferences uh, of the same conference at different years. And by, by being able to link all the data together, she's actually able to find related conferences, calls for papers, templates for submissions, and so on. Right? So, so these are things that we can consider, whether we are able to create such an environment to allow such discovery to happen. Even, for example, at like the ETD, uh, are there, if we want to create an ecosystem, what about the ETD like, like this particular conference? Are we able to put together a site where we put together our, our programs, our speakers, our events, our after a conference discussions, dinners, and so on, right? Are these valuable resources? If they are, then are we able to put it into this system to allow people to discover them? Right now, most of the things that we have in conferences are basically archived into the web itself. We put in all our proceedings, we put in sometimes some of the photographs or some of the discussions, and we let the search engines crawl and find, right? And if we want to discover things that happen in certain conferences, we need to use the search engine. Why not give us the flexibility to be able to put things in a much more managed manner so that people are able to, to search for them much more effectively as part of the whole ecosystem? So, the, so, so, uh, so, so, so Chang Xue told me that eventually, if I'm interested to look for a person, we can be thinking of when things are all well connected, like what we have, for example, at the Google kind of knowledge graph, then we're really able to draw up a very nice history of the particular person that we're interested in. So for her, for example, uh, we can quickly identify the thesis, where it came from, links to her PhDs, articles she's produced, supervisors, and so on, right? So literally, it supports different facets of discovery once we're able to create such a system. Okay? So this is what I think perhaps we should be all thinking about. And in here, I just give you some examples of systems that is developed in Europe that talks much more about research data. Uh, in a view of time, I won't go into too much detail, but basically if, if I search for a particular uh, area, you find that there are a lot of information that is due to research data, publications, and so on. You can find them there. You can actually look at the different uh, kind of information that's out there. The important thing that to note here is about the related publications, the related materials that has been put in there, like data sets, questionnaires, and code books that you can find. And whenever you search for a particular document, you find a rich set of metadata. If you then look at the metadata and zoom in, you'll be able to look at data sets, you're able to look at code books, you're able to look at all the questionnaires being done. So that is really the integration of uh, ETDs with research data. But the whole idea is that beyond uh, this itself, can you go for more than that? Okay. So this is sort of a discovery already of research, research data, research collaborators, people, and so on. Right? And this is really already a two-stage of the ecosystems being developed. Now I'm thinking of the third stage. Are we now able to look at beyond research, research data, to look at other documentation that is out there? Are we able to, to put things in a better perspective so that we can have a better opportunity to discovery uh, to other things that's out there. Okay? So this is my last slide. These are the benefits of the ETD system. It allows us to have a systematic documentation and management of the whole research process. It gives us the ability to, to uh, make it available and make it more visible for people to increase the publicity of what we have conducted so far. And of course, when people are able to discover, use them, then obviously the impact of the research would have a far reaching uh, opportunity for the researcher. And more important for us is to allow the rich discovery of uh, different uh, people who have different information needs. We really want them to have the chance to find information that is really useful for them, to go into a much more intimate uh, uh, sort of exploring of what's actually happened in the, the thesis itself, in the production of the thesis. Okay? So that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for your time and attention.